It's always nice to have your friends introduce you. Are you getting what you need? Okay. All right. I have to apologize going into this because I discovered actually two nights ago that I had a sore throat. And so I've been battling at getting the best of me. And it may be that before the end of this talk, it will get the best of me. But I'm prepared to hydrate and hopefully can get through everything. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. See? Uh, I have done that uh, at Ohio State for 18 years, and each time that I do it, I have to say, it's okay if you talk back, right? <laughs> now that I'm back home, Georgia is home, I do that, and people just say, hi, right? You know, so it's really, it's really a pleasure being back home. And now that I join you in a highly technological and scientific environment, I am just uh, wallowing in the curiosity of what it means to be a liberal arts person within this context. I take great pleasure, though, in being able to deliver the James Berlin Memorial Lecture. Jim, as Bud has said so beautifully, was a good colleague and friend. Most people don't know, though, as we didn't ourselves until later in the game, that Jim and I were classmates at Michigan and shared the same dissertation advisor. We didn't know that though. We were in different programs. And in a place like Michigan during that era in our disciplinary history, there was more of a siloing effect than there is today even. And we never officially met. In sub subsequent years, we surmised that surely we crossed paths in our advisor's office. How could we not? But we never really officially met. Uh, we never realized during this time that a few short years later we would become colleagues in the very best sense of the word while sitting around the executive committee table of the Conference on College Composition and Communication. We shared many beliefs and concerns, developed a respect for each other, and from my perspective I developed a deep admiration for a fine mind and ethical consciousness at work. I share this piece of history not simply because I feel nostalgic about my camaraderie with Jim each time I set foot on this campus, but also because I wish to underscore for graduate students that graduate school, the cauldron within which our personal identities are formed, is a moment also forming bonds that have the capacity to take you through a lifetime of relationships related to common causes and common interests. With Jim, even though we became colleagues after the fact, I still feel the bonds of our common causes and take considerable joy in being able to return periodically to the institutional site at which he gave so much of his time, his talent, and his energy. So thank you for inviting me. In my exchanges with Linda Bergman about what topics the audience might be interested in for this talk, she said to me that I was free to choose any topic, but that the students might um, be interested in my latest work. Well, sometimes I hate to admit it, but what is typical for me is that I'm actually working on several things at once. Uh, sometimes it feels quite insane, but in truth, despite the fact that I'm multiply engaged, I've always managed to create an umbrella for my projects that make them feel coherent and meaningful, and perhaps more importantly, that makes me feel alive and intellectually robust. So regardless of the risk to sanity, I find that I search for diversity and variety. Most recently, I've been focused on five projects. I've spent more years than I care to count working with five other colleagues on the Norton Anthology of Rhetoric and Writing, trying in my section to define and represent a sense of what constitutes the modern in the history of rhetoric. And I'm pleased to say that the collection is now out for what we hope, what we hope is its final review. We're anticipating, in fact, that the volume will actually go to press this time in 2011. 
I've also been working on a view of public literacy and public rhetoric that has been shaped by my involvement in a documentary film project on hospice care in South Africa, a project that emerged from my interest in the, in the participation of, Af of women of African descent in health discourses. I have an article about my observations in the special issue of Jack related to the Watson Conference, if any of you are going to that, it's volume 29 which will constitute the basis for my participation in that conference this year. What has emerged from this project, however, is also an opinion piece that I've collaboratively written with Bruce Horner, Min Zan Lu, and John Trimber, entitled Language Difference in Writing Toward a Translingual Approach. It's going to be published in College English in January. A third project has been a co-authored project with Gisa Kirsch, in which we seek to give an accounting of feminist rhetorical studies and how those of us who define ourselves by a range of feminist and foreign practices have created significant impact in the field of rhetorical studies. Gisa and I have co-authored an article that was published in the June Three Cs, and now a volume entitled Feminist Rhetorical Practices New Horizons for Rhetoric, Composition, and Literacy, which we just submitted a couple of weeks ago, and we hope that it's the fi in final form for SIU Press. My ongoing work is on the participation of African American women in public discourses. I have a volume that I've been working on for a while now. I can tell you the traces of a stream took me about 15 years. Part two is going to take me about 10 or 12 or maybe 15, who knows. But I hope one day to have time to finish it. And the working title of it is A Nation Within, Utopian Desire, Radical Action, and the Voices of African American Women. Now with my new job at Georgia Tech, I now have a brand new project focused on what I believe to be the tremendous potential of the liberal arts in the 21st century at institutions like Georgia Tech and this one. I've been trying to think about the contemporary opportunities that we as liberal arts people in science and technology rich context uh, do. How we should clarify and perhaps redefine who we are as proponents of the liberal arts to consider more consciously how provocatively uh, our areas shape and enrich interdisciplinary enterprises and to think more deliberately about the values that, that we bring to human endeavors within the science and technology rich world in which we live. Now I share this list of interests in order to underscore how very hard it was for me to choose a topic for this talk. Mm -hmm. So in the qu question and answer period, if you'd like to talk a little bit about any of these subjects, I'd be pleased to oblige. They all form a coherent cloth of my intellectual life and they all matter greatly to me. Today though, I didn't exactly close my eyes and throw darts, but I did choose probably rather for rather peculiar reasons to share with you what I'm going to uh, with the Norton Anthology of Rhetoric and Writing. The title that I've chosen reflects then the role that I have assumed in this editorial group, defining a modern era for the history of rhetoric. So I'm going to tell you the story of that participation and then share a section from the general rationale that I've been using for organizing that section. I joined the editorial team for this project supposedly as an expert on, the 19th, on 19th century rhetorics. Over the years, however, I've faced innumerable challenges as the assignment morphed almost immediately into both the 19th and 20th centuries, challenges that I won't detail totally here, but principal among them has been my struggle to figure out in a way that is persuasive to my editorial teammates how we should conceptualize these two centuries as a rhetorical space in a way that's manageable, not simply for the book project, but also for classrooms in rhetorical studies. A critical point to acknowledge is that for all of the periods of rhetorical studies that precede the 19th and 20th century, from the ancients through the 18th century, 
we've actually built, at least to some degree, a considerable amount of consensus in the field already, albeit through Western eyes, through what constitutes those historical eras, what the seminal texts and traditions are, and thereby what constitutes the sorts of opportunities that we now have as contemporary researchers and scholars to broaden and deepen the scope of these visions in global terms for our more contemporary work. For the 19th century onward, however, and especially for the 20th century and now the 21st, there is no such consensus, no such comfort. First, there is a huge amount of material from which to choose from written and oral traditions as well as from fast-growing multimedia, multimodal developments. Second, almost everything available for consideration, like most things that we deem modern, remains in contention and negotiation and has become a matter of particular interest and particular point of view. Quite simply, we just haven't done the type of reflective field-level negotiations to make text selections for what is definable as a general anthology rather than a specialized anthology, simple or easy. Or even to make the construction of a disciplinary master narrative simple or easy. Choices for both text selection and creating a master narrative are bountiful. So the challenge has been this. Which text should we select as basic? critical to the history of the field or foundational? How should we cast a narrative, master or otherwise, to convey continuity and change, ongoing rhetorical productivity, and transformative rhetorical action? Whether we're focused on history, criticism, theory, or practice, all, I might add, in just one volume that most students might have a chance of lifting up from a desk. <laughs> so, as I said earlier, for more years than I care to count, the editorial team has been going back and forth on how we should present the 19th and the 20th century, centuries, and now, of course, the 21st century. To put it mildly, my frustrations for this project have been simply amazing. In so many ways, it's been the proverbial bane of my existence, with my wondering constantly why in the world I had allowed myself to be talked into this project. But still, I've been drawn in complete fascination to the task. Then, not quite out of the blue, but about two years ago, after trying to accommodate what felt like the 50th concern for the section, I came to a point of peace for myself. I stopped trying to come up with an interesting set of re readings capable of being a good narrative fit for our editorial goal of fashioning a volume that is more inclusive of both rhetoric and writing, more balanced in terms of gender, and more conscious of traditions beyond elite male Western traditions. I decided instead to actually enact what it means to be modern, in keeping with what I consider to be the very best of the modernist tradition. That is, in keeping with the aesthetic and cultural work that was occurring at the turn of the 20th century, with people seeing many arenas as an activist space, as an opportunity for disrupting cultural and aesthetic expectations. I decided then to just chuck my sense of constraint and impossibility with this project, to break myself more distinctively from the continuum of elite white male Western traditions that I felt was still defining the rhetorical centrality of the project, in order to search for a new organizational paradigm. In this case, the new paradigm that I was searching for was a framework that would push my thinking beyond just a search for a balance between anointed voices and alternate ones. Beyond a search for alternate spaces for the default spaces of traditional rhetorical action. Beyond the linking of non-traditional topics to traditional ones. I wanted to push myself to stand back from all of that, to stop wallowing in the weeds of the tried and true, 
and to start thinking more deliberately about the patterning of rhetorical enterprises during this time period. What the patterns seem to be, where they seem to be coming from, what they seem to be suggesting about language use and about human beings as language using animals. One thing I began to realize was that for the pro this project, I had been setting aside the frameworks which, with which so many colleagues in rhetorical studies, including myself, are actually doing in rhetorical work these days, and not incorporating those frameworks, those ways of seeing, being, and doing well enough into my own thinking about this project. It was amazing to me how strong a hold these habits had on even my own thinking. I hadn't been paying enough attention, attention to the project as a representation of rhetorical realities rather than an organization of them. I began to see that the new paradigm that I was looking for was not a new organizational schema at all. Instead, I was really searching for a schema that permitted me to represent the extent to which our contemporary practices offer different ways of thinking about rhetorical enterprises <coughs> as enterprises. So the question became not which scholars or practitioners I should choose or which texts deserve valorization within our defaulted circles of rhetorical history, but how I should envision rhetorical action, how I should cast a narrative line, how I should present and represent in an inclusive and expansive way the historical contours of rhetorical action as a diversely rendered global enterprise. I started asking myself, what has occurred in the history of rhetoric, in the history of the world that has helped us to move away from a elite white male Western viewpoints and pushed us to talk about the existence of rhetorics in a plural form rather than a singular form. What has pushed us to take into account that rhetoric occurs in places that are not Western black culture? with rhetors that are not always men, among peoples that are not always elites, and so on. I began to ask, how in the world did we get from there to here, from a field totally defined by our sense of Greek and Roman culture to a field that has no choice but to recognize that rhetoric is a richly definable worldwide phenomenon? As, as I thought about my editorial task more paradigmatically, these types of questions pushed me even more. I began to ask the obvious. Is there a contemporary parallel or contrast for ancient or classical rhetoric? Is there a moment that we can mark as a paradigmatic shift from the ancient, medieval, renaissance, and early modern era to an era that is decidedly modern. What constitutes it? How? Why? When did it begin? How has it evolved? Is it becoming something beyond modern as we think about, as we think about um, literary studies or cultural studies or other things that we have named modern? Once I started asking these types of questions, some answers became obvious. One is the fact that we can't answer any of these types of questions by the analysis of texts alone. We have to include analyses of context and processes as well. Doing so moves us yet again to question what then actually constitutes change for rhetorical enterprises? What constitutes continuity? What were the contexts and processes that nurtured change as we moved historically from one era to the next, to the next, and then the next, and the next? Well, in thinking about a modern era, scholarship and practice of the last 200 years 
document quite clearly, if we are paying attention, that the old worlds of rhetorical engagement and regard, in which elite white Western viewpoints ruled, were unquestionably imperial spaces. In contrast, the shift toward a modern world of rhetorical engagement and regard is likewise marked just as distinctively by the extent to which it is not comfortably imperial, and perhaps more distinctively by a conscious recognition around the globe that our imperial past has created whirlpools of impacts and consequences that continue to reverberate in our lives and behaviors including in our rhetorical behaviors. The bottom line then is that I acknowledge more consciously and directly that this project, for this project, that bef more than ever before, that rhetoric took on a recognizably modern feel very much in sync with the downfall of imperial giants with the last giant standing now being the United States of America. While I'm sorely tempted to bring into this analysis that the contemporary discourses that surround the Obama administration are a dramatic display of this type of synchronization, and I dare say syncopation, uh, it, that's another project, and I won't take the time to go into it here. Suddenly then, instead of being mostly the bane of my intellectual existence, my deep curiosity about the shift from earlier eras to a modern one, about how we might set aside the notion of a long march through rhetorical history that is more about organizing some sort of pattern for the 1920s and 21st century than interrogating the nature, shape, and consequence of rhetoric during this time period was boring. So allow me now to skip ahead over quite a bit of the process that ensued in my effort to articulate this framework, to construct a set of readings and relationships, and most of all, uh, my coming to feel excited and comfortable about my way of seeing our contemporary rhetorical world. What I can do in the time that remains is to focus on what I identi identify as three quite fluid contexts for change. And one was the impact of scientific and technological innovation. A second was the impact of the age of discovery. And a third was the impact of a passion for social justice and social change. Now, unfortunately, I can't talk about all of these, so I've to chosen, because it's for Duke, to talk about the first one, the impact of scientific and technological innovation. One set of factors that links easily in charting a pathway to modernity includes evolving patterns for building wealth and power for both individuals and societies related to inventions, commerce, trade, and the related emergence of new and different political and social hierarchies. With a continuous rise from the Middle Ages onward of a manufacturing-based economy and a sparkling array of scientific and technological advancements, European economic practices and patterns began to change. Such changes included the migration of large numbers of the population from rural to urban areas, linked to where the workforce needed to be located, a rising dependence on mechanized production of manufactured goods in large-scale enterprises rather than on the skills of craftsmen and artisans or on family or community labor. The replacement of bartering systems with transactions using paper money and with such inventions as weight-driven clocks, a mechanism that helped to facilitate changes in the patterns of daily life. The shifting from a daylight-driven workday to a more highly constrained hour-driven one with production expectations and hourly wages. 
These types of economic factors help to push the old world along its winding pathway toward becoming a modern world. In like manner, the drift toward modernity was greatly affected by changes in the ways and means of communication media. Noteworthy among such changes is the invention by Johannes Gutenberg in 1440 in Strasbourg, Germany, not of a printing press, actually, but a printing press with movable metal type. Accounts of Gutenberg's move from Mainz to Strasbourg in 1430 and his move back to Mainz in 1444. A list of milestones in the invention and development of the printing press and a bibliography of resources related to this landmark invention all attest to the importance of the printing press in rhetorical history. The typical bottom line is that after Gutenberg, Gutenberg's death in 1468, the printing press began its meteoric rise with German expertise playing an important role. The names of more than 100 printers, mostly of German origin, have come down to us from the 15th century. In Italy, we find well over 100 German printers. In France, 30. In Spain, 26 all with the, an acknowledgment that many of the earliest printers outside of Germany had learned their art in Mainz, where they were known as goldsmiths. The point in this narrative that doesn't get as much attention is that print culture in China and in Korea is much older than in Europe. Current artifacts suggest that woodblock printing was invented in East Asia. Buddhist scriptures were discovered in a Korean pagoda dating to 750 CE. The fact of the matter is that the invention of paper was perhaps even more important than the invention of a press that used metal movable type. Note then that paper was invented in China in 105 AD and a printing press with movable clay type was invented by Bi Sheng in China in 1040, 1041. Note also that inventors in Europe other than Gutenberg were also developing movable type, including Procopius Walfogel of France and Lawrence Jansen Koster of the Netherlands. However, Gutenberg's mechanical modifications of these inventions, and particularly his invention of metal type and oil-based ink, which also doesn't get enough credit in narratives of rhetorical history, were catalytic in the phenomenal growth and development of print culture, not just in Germany, where Gutenberg lived, but across Europe and ultimately around the world. His inventions enhanced greatly the economic viability of press printing, making it far more efficient and affordable to produce longer text in larger numbers faster. As the first mechanisms for the mass production of high quality books, Gutenberg's printing press became a driver in Europe and ultimately around the world for a broad array of social, cultural, and industrial changes. By the turn of the 15th century, Germany had become a dominant source of expertise in the fast-growing printing industry. Printing houses had been established in more than 2,500 cities throughout Europe. An estimated 15 million books had been printed, representing 30,000 book titles and the world was well on its way in experiencing what would amount to a major cultural shift and the emergence ultimately of global markets for print production. In addition to the economic value added by the increased needs of paper making, the making of oil-based inks as compared with water-soluble inks, and the manufacture of the tools and machines of the print trade, there were three developments, given this analysis, that serve special note. 
One is the development of literacy among the masses of society. They had access to books. The growth of a scholarly scientific community and the emergence of censorship policies and copyright laws. Now, in the making of the rationale for how, how I um, organize that section, I go on to point out uh, some more details about these three effects of print culture and to think about how this combination laid a dramatically different landscape for the emergence of a modern era for, um, for rhetoric. I'm not going to go into those three, but that's, that's what I identified them to be. In addition to media technologies, other technologies were emerging during this transitional moment that were similarly consequential to the social, political, and cultural changes that evinced a modern era. Consider, for example, the invention, invention of bicycles, <coughs> steam engines, automobiles, trains, and airplanes, all of which revolutionized transportation and the ability of individuals and groups to conduct their affairs more broadly, geographically, to migrate, to reinvent themselves, and expand their life's possibilities. Likewise was the invention of the telephone, telegraph, typewriters, and ultimately digital technologies, which have revolutionized communications beyond textual production, and revolutionized as well the ways and means of social and political debates. What stands clear from this narrative is that the invention of a printing press that used metal movable type, the invention of paper and its subsequent modifications that prevented ink from spreading so uncooperatively through it, and the invention of oil-based inks serve as a provocative symbol of the extent to which literacy and rhetoric can be intricately linked to dynamic cultural change. The rise of print culture, the growth of the printing industry, and the development of legal controls accomplished four important results. A democratizing of access to information, an extension of the privilege of expressing ideas to a much broader segment of the population, an escalation in the building of a scholarly community, and the emergence of a system that supported compensation or literate labor. These changes connect not only the rise of capitalism and industrialism, the building of wealth by individuals and nations, the shifting of class lines and social status, but also the coalescing of a spirit of self-determination, sociocultural critique, and sometimes social upheaval and revolution. The technologies that converged made possible the fomenting of change, the shaping of an information age in the 19th and 20th centuries, and the phenomenal growth of a di digital revolution at the end of the 20th century and the turn of the 21st century. All of these factors have functioned dynamically in helping to establish what might be called a modern era for rhetoric and writing. Well, I think that I've run out of time in terms of going through the other two areas, but suffice it to say, I began to see the task of putting together a modern era for the, the uh, Norton anthology with new eyes. Ultimately, I chose the decline of imperialism as an anchoring moment from which to think about rhetoric as a contemporary practice. I found the choice to be liberating. Now I'm waiting for a response and hoping that the reviewers see the integrity and relevance of this perspective and the choices that I have selected to enact and represent this narrative line. I ended my argument to my editorial teammates with this statement, though. For a volume such as this one, the question becomes whether we can think more critically and systematically about the notion of an enlarged, more inclusive perspective of history, criticism, theory, and practice. How do we situate Western experiences and sentiments 
in both space and time. What are the similarities and dissimilarities? The connections, overlaps, and discontinuities between Western cultures and others. What constitutes a manageable springboard and set of strategies for seeing the substance of where we are in the world, where we have been, how we have negotiated our desires and relationships, and what might lie ahead when we take ourselves out of self-anointed prime positions of supreme agency and authority and consider the agency, authority, and historical participation of others. How do we globalize where we are so that we are better positioned to look positively and productively forward, not just backward? With habits of reflection and contemplation at our backs, we are compelled now to spend substantial time looking around and ahead. Recent scholarship seeks to address such questions in the ways that they are exposing what is different rather than just what is constant and charting points of connection, overlap, as well as discontinuity. A kaleidoscopic view of the ways in which the world shifted from old to new provides a provocative context with, with, within which to engage in such inquiries. The point to be emphasized, however, is that a modern era in rhetoric and writing has been marked by its context and the extent to which we have come to new points of reference, including the following. A clearer understanding than ever before of power dynamics and the implications of a world history that has been and continues to be fraught with social, political, and economic hierarchies and their consequences. A recognition of the importance of scientific and technological innovations and their capacity to affect dramatically the conduct of human affairs. A clearer sense of language as a critical resource in human, in human enterprises, one that demands critique and care as we continue to use it to live and enrich our lives. An acknowledgment of the basic rationality given modern affairs, of setting a global scope for our critical inquiries and through the co collectivity of our research, seeking to render that landscape in a more comprehensive and more finely grained way. A recognition of the need to take a 360 degree analytical view of the ways and means of rhetoric and writing, looking consciously and deliberately back and forward, as well as up, around, and beneath as we form theories and draw conclusions about what constitutes excellence in both rhetorical scholarship and rhetorical performance. These markings remind us that in fleshing out more precisely the nature of our transitioning from old world to new world, not just generally but through the lens of rhetoric and writing, we now have a greater capacity to bring deeper meaning to the cultural context of communication and two basic rhetorical concerns about who exactly says what to whom, under what circumstances and conditions, and with which imperatives and mandates, and with what impacts and consequences. Now I suppose that the very last thing that I need to say is that this essay, which actually is about 20 pages longer than what I've read to you, is not the introduction to my section. I wish it were. One, it's far too long. It was the rationale that I used for organizing my section in a way that made me feel quite comfortable with putting an ethical stake in the ground. I don't know exactly how I will extrapolate an introductory framework from all this. <laughs> so if you have ideas, I'd love to hear them. Thank you. Yes.
I can say that work like uh, McHenry's has had a significant uh, influence on what I've included in the anthology because I consider it my work, the work of my compatriots in rhetoric, composition, and literacy, uh, the work of my compatriots in feminist rhetorics because part of what we've been doing over these last 30 plus years is opening up the scope of what constitutes rhetorical action, uh, where it can, can happen, uh, what is a text, uh, who are we talking about, how we can think about um, uh, rhetorical effects. So yes, that the sentiment that Elizabeth expresses in that book is one that I share, and certainly one that I have tried to enact as I put together this section. Now that's not to say that um, uh, conceptually the experiences of the people that I have spent most of my professional life looking at are disconnected in modern terms from the rest of the world. Um, part of my ongoing struggle after coming to this kind of narrative line was still what do you choose? How do you choose it? Why do you choose it? And so it still didn't make it simple. It just made me feel more comfortable about the complexity of it. Um, and so um, there will be many of the same theorists that you might expect to find in any uh, rhetorical history. There are a lot of new voices. Many of them are talking about issues of identity and relationship, self and society in ways that we don't ordinarily include in the history of rhetoric collections. But it's because we don't include a lot of, um, of uh, writing. We include theory. And so as you, as you um, I hope you picked up in one of the sections that I was trying to explain is that the effort in the whole book is to have both rhetoric in terms of how we study rhetorical practices and writing, that is people who are actually enacting those experiences in the same volume. That was part of the story. It wasn't just struggling over the 19th and 20th century, but how, you know, if you can think about 2,500 years worth of rhetorical study, Think about 2,500 years worth of rhetorical study and expression, uh, our desire to have more than one genre represented. You know, so it was, it was really hard trying to figure out how to make that one book, even a Norton book, you wouldn't be able to look at, lift it, you know. So um, yeah, but that value is one of the values that I brought to how I would cast my circle so that it felt normal to have Stephen Biko in my section. Well, he's there. I don't know if he's going to stay, but he's <laughs> there right now, right? Because I think from a global perspective, it's important to include someone like that whose rhetoric changed a nation. Uh, or Fidel Castro. You don't see him in a lot of stuff, right? Well, he's in mine. And I think he's presented normally. No. They wouldn't be presented normally in the way that we have been doing our field. He would be presented, uh, both of them would pre be presented as alternative voices. Yeah. Hi, my name's Morgan. Hi, Morgan. Um, okay, 
So it sounds to me like in part, um, and maybe I'm thinking, okay, so I think that you're arguing that, that rhetoric, um, through its shift towards multiple rhetorics and multiplicity in its perspective, is kind of poised to help um, interpret and understand global shifts in rhetoric and communication as they're emergent and be able to recognize and accept them, not as alternate, but as um, cohesively interacting. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess my question stems from the science and technology part because I'm researching scientists right now. And part of what I've found is that the paradigm of multiplicity that we have um, is, is, <coughs> so, is so different and foreign to their paradigms. Mm -hmm. And while we're like, oh, paradigm, 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 and they're like, what is this paradigm you speak of? Like, and there's been in science, even as there's this um, influence and change in culture that science has brought on, there's this continuous narrowing of viewpoint and perspective and expression within scientific communities and technology communities. And I guess I'm wondering um, if you get to address that at all in your text or sort of like how we're going to negotiate with even people across the quad or yeah. you know, in our academic fields and stuff like that. Well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to deal with all of that in my introduction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm having trouble just figuring out how to even deal with the notion that I start uh, the, the um, drift heart modernity in the Middle Ages. <laughs> you know, so what are you talking about? That's the Middle Ages. You're supposed to be thinking about the modern. Um, well, um, what I want to believe is that once we break through all of that, what we would come to is that we're talking about reading and viewing experiences that need to be interrogated, that don't just sit there, okay? And so while scientists might have a different framework from which they're operating, do we just dismiss them because they're different? Do they dismiss us because they, we're different? Yeah, they do. But how do we encourage them not to do that. How do we show them that there is value added by kicking yourself out of that habitual mode to at least listen to another way of articulating something? Because it does bring a different perspective. Uh, I thought that you were going with your question how in uh, the first person, how in rhetorical studies we have disregarded listening and reading. And one of the things that put making rhetorics plural does is to bring those two into the conversation a whole lot more boldly than we have. Now we're again, we're, we've started doing a little bit more with reading and as we talk about interpretation. We've started to do a little bit more with listening. But we've got to take those two uh, sets of skills a whole lot more seriously than we've been before. And to think uh, more deliberately about what <coughs> having them uh, normalize in the mix actually means. So that you can sit down with a scientist who says, so what's up with this paradigm thing that you're talking about? And you're able to have a conversation about that. Um, or What's up with your not thinking about paradigms? How can you do this without paradigm? Do you, do you know the model that you're using? Because when people talk about models in science, they often are not talking about the kinds of things that we're talking about in the humanities and the social sciences. And so how do we create that common space that allows us to see the richness of what we're doing together? With, I would say, the critical goal being that these kinds of conversations mirror the complexities of the grand challenges that we face in the world. If we can't figure out how to talk to each other about paradigms, how are we going to really resolve the problem of hunger? You know, so there there are those kinds of high-level uh, interconnections that I think 
these kinds of things become five finger exercises for. Yes. Mm-hmm. And health. I was wondering, how do you see rhetoric, uh, race, and documentary filmmaking as interacting? In which way do they come together? Say the last part one more time. In which way do they come together? So what, is, what are the points where documentary filmmaking, oh. rhetoric, and race sort of intersect? Okay. Well, for me in that project, I went on this trip to apprentice at the feet of uh, African women, white, colored, and black, who are leaders in the hospice care movement, which means that I went to listen, to look, to seek to, as uh, Krista Ratcliffe says, to be washed in the understanding of what they do on a daily basis. So I could think about whether or not I see myself in those relationships, whether or not I see my work in those relationships. Uh, and so they came together for me uh, in that project through the visual experience of putting together that film. The film was not my work. A filmmaker was there, a producer was there, the producer was a long-term hospice advocate that wants to get the story of hospice care in uh, South Africa out because it happens very differently there from hospice here. And it's a wonderful difference that people need to know about. I was kind of fascinated by poster art, you know, so that was a visual experience. I kept seeing these posters and kept understanding from a cultural studies perspective how they were representing issues that had the capacity to circulate in that society in a way that we don't pay very much attention to here. And so I want to know, so where is our equivalent of poster art? Well, you know, I didn't put it in this article, but I think our t-shirts come about as close as anything to the kind of effect that that kind of, uh, what I ended up calling open air literacy has there. And so it's coming together of what it means to listen, what it means to read, what it means to try to understand from someone else's experience base what a problem is. Because we could have gone, I was traveling with six, six American women and a big old film crew. And we could have just walked in there the same way that Americans usually walk in there everywhere else, stomping all over everything and assuming that we know everything. And just kind of telling our story as their story. When in fact, what we tried to do with some success, I believe, is to listen to what they were saying about themselves. Which we encourage our students to do in classes, but do we really help them to act that out in other kinds of ways? So yeah, it all came together in that way. Uh, I guess I, I would say I connect that project to my larger teaching uh, project, to my larger project of trying to um, understand how language. I'm wondering is, do you think you're going to have any resistance either from editors or readers um, who want an anthology this person to latch on to? Are going to say, oh no 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 no, where is this essay? You know, you, where is this one person? Um, do you see that as, as being a problem? I do. I think we tend to be a great men's uh, organizers, you know, who are the stars. Let's put these configurations around them, and then that's the story we tell. We don't usually tell the story from the processes or from the context. And this story is from the context and from the processes. So yeah, I expect to have resistance. But that's why I like what I did, because it feels right to me. Now, I'm not going to claim that it's going to get to stand. That's why I'm very curious about what these reviewers are saying about this, this, uh, this uh, anthology. Now, it's not 
in the end that different? What is different is the narrative that I use to produce it. Because you will see all of the figures that you would expect to see in a rhetoric of, um, an, in an anthology on the history of rhetoric. You have to, because they're part of the context and the processes, but they're not the only things there. And I believe that there will be some people who will be very impatient about all the extraneous stuff. So, you know, why do you have that in there? Is, is, does that really matter to the really seminal definitions of what constitutes the history of rhetoric in the modern era? Or is this just stuff you like? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, it's stuff I like. <laughs> yeah. On that note, um, I was wondering if you would share with us. The essentially unfamiliar. The most familiar person in there, I'm trying to think of what ended up being the final version, because even my co editors didn't want everything I wanted, right? Mm -hmm. um, probably the most familiar person will be um, Maria Stewart. You know Maria Stewart? And I put her in as uh, a United States-based voice of resistance. The second choice that I had was for American-based resistance was uh, David Walker. Do you know David Walker? But his texts are, are more difficult for young readers to understand because he, he has, he doesn't, he doesn't write with as a clear and straightforward a flair as Maria Stewart does. She is easier to process. She is also a female voice of uh, mid-19th century resistance rather than a male voice, and they're accustomed to male voices. But I also pulled in uh, Zitkala Sa, you know her? Yeah, she's a Native American woman. Uh, and we're, we don't always think of how long the resistance among Native Americans has been. So I went to put in her voice. I went to Mexico and got, well, you know, I know a lot of women, so my natural bent is not to put in a lot of men because I don't know them. <laughs> right? So I put in this, this Mexican woman. And um, she was a poet and she did newspapers. And as literate as we think we are in rhetoric, composition, and literacy, we don't usually talk about in the Americas the importance of periodical press in Mexico, you know? Uh, so I wanted her in there. And then I had a young colleague down at the University of Texas, El Paso, to translate for me, because my Spanish is okay, but it's not good enough to translate a text that I want to make sure is respectfully and authentically rendered. Um, uh, Christina, you know Christina Ramirez? Um, yeah, she was the one that I asked to help with that. Uh, who else did I put in? Then I put in, um, so you're pressing me on names now. My brain cells are old. I don't, I don't remember stuff that I'm not looking at. But the, the European guy, um, who uh, rebelled against Austria. I put in a text for, for him. Uh, I can't think of his name. You'll have to see it. Because he represented a class of people who were resisting uh, uh, kind of governance structures in Europe in ways that we don't usually think about as resistance. And so, the whole point of that section from, oh, and the Chinese woman, who, uh, Chen, oh shoot, I'm not going to remember any names now. But so, uh, a woman from China, a woman from Mexico, Maria Stewart, uh, the guy from, from uh, Europe, uh, another woman from South America, and I think I had one more guy in there that I found somewhere. So two men and four women, all there to kind of help put in place the notion 
that in the 19th century, resistance to imperial oppressions of various definitions was a global experience. A goal of the text is to try to put in as many people as we could. So we tried not to uh, repeat. So if you were there once, you were there for that one thing. Because there are so many different choices. Um, in my section, I did, like that, that section is the first one. It's a case study. We did case study. So that's my case study. It's a practice case study. Then I did a theoretical section, theory and criticism, another practice, a theory and criticism, and I ended up with a practice. Okay. Um, and so there is that, if you're not looking very closely, you might not notice, but I'm telling you, so now you can go look and see, yes, you really did kind of box people up as either practitioners or theorists of one kind or another. But it was just for manageability. You know, it got to be way too complex for me to try to cross over all of those things. I did actually count in terms of gender. I did actually count in terms of the number of people that I have for each decade from um, I, it, I ended up negotiating that I would go from 1890 to uh, the 1990s. So Tom Miller, who is the one before me, has the full 19th century now. He wanted that, so I said, go take it then, right? <laughs> Even though I'm supposed to be the 19th century person, you get the 19th century, okay. And then Andrea did the um, 21st century. And so, I tried to balance it that way. Um, we tried to talk about uh, theory and criticism and practice in, in more fluid terms. Uh, you will have to let us know if that works. You know, I don't know. It may be that we think it's more fluid than it actually is. But you're, you, know, you, you are constrained by the habits of the discipline and the way that you represent some things. You can't get too far outside of the circle or you won't be understood, especially when you're talking about a book that's really designed for classroom work. <coughs> yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the <coughs> collaboration among the co-authors and coming to the decisions about their sections? Mm -hmm. um, It took us about three years to come up with <laughs> what we call through lines. And so uh, we agreed that we would, we would think about how our era dealt with education, how our era dealt with self and society, how our era dealt with, and there were about six of those. And so we agreed on those through lines. We uh, respected our expertise and we allowed, uh, we allowed each section editor to choose the things that, uh, that uh, seem from that uh, set of expertise to be a representative and, and realistic way of presenting the particular through line. 
um, we disagreed, friendly disagreements. We didn't actually get it knocked down fights or anything about um, people that we liked that a person would leave out. So how could you leave out so-and-so? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, and then we would talk about, well, what could we put in that would kind of satisfy these kind of hungering desires to see some of our favorite people. And we did that kind of negotiation. Um, what else did we do? We, we were open to talking about given you know, the gender balance, the global balance, the, the uh, time for the chronological balance, the way in which we thought people might want to teach such a text. We gave that over to, this is what I'm thinking now, give me feedback. And we gave each other feedback about those things. We tried to listen and be responsive. So it, was, it really was very collaborative, even though uh, if you were leading, you were leading. Andrea is right in the general. Well, that makes sense because 21st yeah. century is not as long as it is. No. <laughs> she got to be the big boss. Yeah. So she's, uh, she's writing the, the general introduction. She's doing uh, the last case that would be our 21st century case. Uh, in the end, it's, uh, you know, again, you can only lift so many pages. And so we had to decide. We, we spent the last year trying to decide what we were going to do with the 21st century rather than the 20th century, you know. It was, was so much is going on. And so she took that on. Uh, Lu Ming is uh, doing uh, ancient Chinese in India, I think. And Susan Jarrett is doing the Greek and the Romans. And uh, Jody Enders is uh, doing the uh, medieval renaissance. Renaissance. Bob Harriman is doing the, the um, it's the other way around. Jody's doing the medieval. Bob is doing the renaissance. And uh, Tom is doing the long 18th century and uh, the 19th century. And now I'm really just doing the 20th. So we decided that the 20th was its own chunk and uh, that if I could figure out how to do it, they would cooperate. So that's why I spent so much time really putting on paper how I was thinking about it so they could see what it was that, that I was trying to do. And they didn't argue too much about it. They argued about particular people. Because, you know, we do have our 20th century favorites. And it's like, you can't have an anthology without Kenneth Burke in it. You can't have an anthology without so-and-so in it. You know, so, yeah, we went around and around on that. Well, I think we ought to give Jackie a break. And in the journal, you, uh, you want the 20th for um, uh, the book. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.